Welcome to Sports House Podcast, Mile High Talk Edition. I'm Chase House. The Broncos are 2-0 and and tied for the division lead. Uh, that hasn't happened in 273,000 years. The AFC and NFC West went 8-0 and in Week 1 and went 5-3 and in Week 2. One of the losses, the Chiefs, because they just can't keep up and winning is so hard. And my broke ass won money betting on Week 2, so anything is possible. Let's get into it. Sports House Podcast. The Broncos looked pretty good in their 23-13 win over the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, but most teams would look pretty good playing the Jacksonville Jaguars. I expected the Broncos to win by double digits. Um, I felt like they should have at least put up 27 points. Ultimately, I'm not impressed with their Week 2 win. And the win also didn't come without the price of losing yet another star player to injury early on in the season. Bradley Chubb re-aggravated his ankle injury and now joins Jerry Judy on the list of key Bronco injuries early in the season. Of course. The main reason I'm not impressed with the Broncos' double-digit win over the Jaguars is they put up just 23 points against uh, the defense who was second to last in the league last year and was torched by the Houston Texans last week who put up 37 against them with Tyrod Taylor, who is basically just Teddy Bridgewater that can throw deep. Or to say that in a different way, Teddy Bridgewater is Tyrod Taylor that can't throw deep. Also, third downs. The Broncos were horrible on third downs against the Jaguars. Six yards was their longest conversion through the air on third down. It was a six-yard pass. And now, granted, that was one of Teddy Bridgewater's nicer throws of the game over the shoulder to Cortland Sutton for, I think it was like 18 yards. And then we also had a third and eight that was picked up on the ground by Javante Williams on a 14-yard rush. And that's it. Those are the two third down conversions the Broncos had against the Jaguars all game. They were two for 11 on third down. Teddy Bridgewater, he had good stats. Finally completed a deep pass. By deep pass, I mean the deepest pass since he has been a member of the Broncos, preseason or regular season. The ball actually went 20 yards in the air downfield. Like, I'm not even kidding. He actually threw it deep, and and it was a good pass. You know, I'm not going to try to slam on Teddy Bridgewater uh, because, you know, he is the quarterback of the Broncos, and I am rooting for him. However, I just, this kind of football, yes, it's good enough to win against the Jaguars and, and the Giants and probably to win 10 or 11 games with the Broncos schedule. They have a really nice, easy schedule, the fifth easiest in the league. If 10 or 11 wins is your goal, then fine. Then Teddy is the perfect quarterback for you because the Broncos, they can win 10 games with Teddy Bridgewater. They can get 10, maybe 11 wins, sneak into the playoffs, but then that's it. You have to be able to pick up a third and long if you're going to win playoff games, if you're ever going to win a Super Bowl. So if the end goal is to win 10 or 11 games and lose in the first round of the playoffs, then we're on the right track. Some Teddy slander real fast, if you want to call it that. And and then I'm not going to keep slamming, and I'm not trying to belittle Teddy Bridgewater either. It's just I'm still frustrated. Like, he's he's playing good, and I just don't like the fact that certain fans out there get so fixated on the stat sheet for two games. These are the same fans, by the way, that wanted Brett Rippon to be the starting quarterback after he had one good game. Bronco fans need to pump the brakes and have kind of a reality check. Like, this is Teddy Bridgewater. He will complete 80% of his passes, and he will especially do that against horrible teams. Like, I'm not overly impressed. He has played well, yes, and that's great. And, And he hasn't thrown the ball deep. He hasn't needed to throw the ball deep. The Broncos, they don't need that from him to win these games, and that's tr- that's true. 
They don't need to throw the ball deep. They could win with just merely average quarterback play and their schedule. That favors them. But at the end of the day, good teams have to be able to beat other good teams. The Broncos will play the Chiefs twice this year like every year. And if we get to the playoffs, we would probably meet up with them in the postseason. We have to go through the Chiefs, is what I'm saying. There's no other way around it. You have to be able to beat the Chiefs. And if we can't convert a third and seven or longer through the air, we will not beat Kansas City. Like, there was a play against the Jacksonville Jaguars. It was third and 13. And I remember I said out loud, I can't remember exactly where we were down, but I I said, I guarantee Teddy won't pass it past the 25-yard line, which I think was like seven yards, maybe, maybe five, past the line of scrimmage. And it was third and 13. And he threw it (laughs) like two yards short of that line. And, of course, we didn't get the first down. But, like, I overestimated him on making a seven-yard throw on third and 13. For as good as Teddy has been and for as good as stat lines as he's put up, the Broncos scored 23 points against the Jacksonville Jaguars, settled for way too many field goals, could not convert on third down. These are negative things, and so it feels... It feels wrong to slam on a team after they win, um, but not really. <laughs> when you look at the fact, when you look at the facts, right? Jacksonville Jaguars, they had one win last year. One. That is one away from zero, which is literally the bottom that you could ever do. They had one win. Are you kidding me? And you score twenty three points. This defense was second to last last year. And you managed to put up 23 points. And supposedly, we're supposed to believe that that can beat the Kansas City Chiefs offense? Give me a break. 23 points against the Jaguars? Like that, that will not get it done. The defense is good. They held the Jaguars in check. Like, that. it wasn't a... <laughs> wasn't that tall of a task but still nonetheless the Broncos defense they can make a lot of these games winnable Broncos just have to be able to you know complete a third down I also I noticed something um week two on the Thursday night football game I took a screenshot of this right as I noticed it uh the stat line for Taylor Heineke against the New York Giants was at one point identical to the numbers that Teddy Bridgewater put up against the New York Giants. Right here, Teddy Bridgewater finished the game against against the New York Giants 28 of 36, 264 yards, two touchdowns, and a QB rating of 115.7. Taylor Heineke, after his fourth quarter touchdown, Taylor Heineke was 28 of 36, the exact same completions and attempts, and percentage, 300 yards, two touchdowns, and a QB rating of 119.9. And by the way, their teams had the exact same amount of points at this point, 27. And it's just coincidental, but it really, it told me a story that I knew was already the case. If Taylor Heineke can put up the same stat line against a team that Teddy Bridgewater does. Now, I'm not trying to slam on Taylor Heineke either. I think he he played pretty well. So did Teddy. But that's just it. You should not be in comparisons with a Taylor Heineke. You should not be in the same conversations as these guys. And if Taylor Heineke can go ahead and light up the New York Giants, then so could probably half of the league at least. So... That, to me, was just proof that the stat line wasn't really going to tell the whole story here. Like, the Broncos, with an average quarterback in against the Jaguars and the Giants, would put up good numbers. That's all I'm saying, is don't get carried away by looking at the stats and saying, 
wow, Teddy Bridgewater, wow, he had 300 yards, which, by the way, actually did shock me. Um, but then when you look at who he's playing and the fact that we still couldn't complete a third down conversion and we only put up 23 points, it does make sense. His yards were a little exaggerated from what they'll usually be. His his percentage is pretty much on par with what he'll usually complete. And he'll beat bad teams. Thankfully, the Broncos play a lot of bad teams. So it can win games with this schedule. But when it comes down to it, I do not think that this kind of football can beat good teams, especially postseason time. Speaking about playing bad teams... The Broncos' next game, the other trash-ass New York team, the New York Football Jets. The goddamn Jets. And little BYU Zuby boy who just threw four picks Bruh. last week to the New England Patriots. So the Broncos' defense should have a field day. I went to college! Against the New York Jets. Teddy Bridgewater, once again, should and probably will put up good numbers against another wretched football team, if you can even call them a football team. But the looks of it, the Broncos, like I've been saying for some time, they have no excuse to not start 3-0 this year. And I, I will honestly, I'll be disappointed if they don't win by at least 10. But against the Jets, I would like to see this offense put up like 30 points. It should not be too much to ask for. And when you look at the Broncos' first three games, Giants, Jaguars, Jets, if you can't put up 30 points with the offensive firepower that is on this team, I don't care what the quarterback stat line is. That's not good. 30 points against the Jaguars or the Giants or the Jets, that is 100% manageable. We should, have got, we should get 30 points against all those guys. So, going into this game against the Jets, I expect the Broncos to win by double digits. Hold Zach Wilson in check, and they should pick him off at least two times and score 30 points. That's what I want to see. And I, I honestly, I don't feel like that's too much to ask for. The Broncos are a good team. The Jets are awful. They are water trash, and they are garbage, and they have a, Man, 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 man I don't know how to play football. Playing quarterback. If you look at the AFC West standings, you'll notice something unusual. Well, okay, a couple things unusual. Number one, the Chiefs are not at the top. No complaints there. And then another one, the Broncos and Raiders are at the top. That's a little strange. And the fact that the Raiders are undefeated makes me kind of want to vomit in my mouth and shit in my hand and clap. The Broncos, though, are where they belong, at the top of this division. And that puts an extra emphasis on winning against the New York Jets this week. If the Broncos can win this game and go to 3-0, and you look at the Chiefs and the Chargers who play each other this week. One of them is going to start 1-2. and two. And in my predictions, it was the Chiefs that would finish first in the division, Broncos second, and the Chargers third, all with over 10 wins. I think these are all good teams, and the Broncos will be up two games over one of them. Shall we win against the New York Jets? So kind of a big week three for the Broncos, and they should not disappoint. But I feel like if I say too much, I will 100% jinx them into disappointing me. So far through two weeks, though, the Broncos 2-0, but we've lost two key players, Jerry Judy and now Bradley Chubb, re-aggravating his ankle injury and has no timeline to return. It just feels like last year and the year before that 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 and for the rest of eternity. The Broncos, they have not had good luck staying healthy for a long time. And last year we got derailed super early in the season injury-wise. So seeing just even two players, two key players, also Ronald Darby, 
he's out too. Um, but two really good key players, Jerry Judy and Bradley Chubb. Like, are we ever going to see Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller on the field at the same time? We've seen them play like four games together ever. They've been on the team for like three, what, four years? Like, he needs some milk. No, he needs some milk. They got milk. I, I know. In week two, I managed to win some money. And I'm not I'm not talking on here to like gloat or anything. It wasn't that much. Um, 74. Who said that? I thought that I could probably be pretty decent at sports betting, at least on the NFL. And so I kind of wanted maybe track my progress as far as uh, smaller bets that can cash in and win big. I'm relatively new to sports betting, so I'm trying out some new strategies and seeing uh, wh what I think can work. And I did that only off of four teams. I had a two-team, I had two bets, two separate bets. One was a two-team six-point teaser. I teased the New England Patriots and the Denver Broncos, who were both six-point favorites, I teased them to a pick em, so all they had to do is just win. And like I mentioned earlier, the Patriots, they played the Jets. They had their way with them. And the Broncos, they beat the Jaguars by double digits. So that was a pretty relatively safe bet that I made some money on. And then I also I paired those games with two more on a separate bet, also a teaser. So I still I had the Broncos teased down to even. The Patriots teased down to an even line. And then the Los Angeles Rams and the Arizona Cardinals. The Rams were playing the Colts, and they were minus three and a half point favorites. And the Arizona Cardinals were playing the Minnesota Vikings, and they were also three and a half point favorites. I teased them six points, so they were each plus 2.5 points. So I added them on with the Patriots and Broncos. And all of them came through for me, so I, I... And the Arizona Cardinal game, I was so glad that I took the Cardinals and got them at 2.5 uh, because there was, like, a one-point differential in their scores for quite some time, and I knew that if it just came down to a field goal at the end of the game, I would be fine. And sure enough, the Cardinals had a one-point lead. The Minnesota Vikings had the ball, and I was hoping that they were just going to try to kick a field goal and win the game because in that way, it 100% guarantees me that I win my bet if they don't score a touchdown. And they lined up for a field goal, wasted time, kicked the field goal, which would have, <laughs> if they made it, they would have won by two, so I still would have covered by .5. But he shanks the shit out of it. I was glad I took him for 2.5 regardless. That way I didn't have to have a heart attack waiting for that field goal. And plus... If I didn't have that 2.5, I guarantee he makes that field goal. Like, the only reason he did not is because I, it didn't matter to my bet. Like, if there was a one millionth percent of a chance out there in the universe that he was going to make the kick, it would come down to the fact that I, I needed him to miss it to win my bet. So thank God I did not. So it didn't matter, so he can miss. So I'm unsure of my my betting teaser that I'm going to do this week, um, or even if I'll do a teaser in general. But considering the fact that I won last week, I think I'll try another teaser. Uh, I'm unsure of which teams. There'll probably be more than four teams this time. Uh, so if I figure out what bet I'm going to do, I will post a little podcast updating on what my picks are. And maybe if you guys like those those type of podcasts, and if I start winning, you know, maybe that's something that I kind of want to do in the future, so so keep your eye out on another podcast and to see if I, if I have time this week. I am pretty busy, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to jump on and make a little podcast about my picks, but if I can, I will, and then if I do, I guarantee I'll lose, like I said. I'll just jinx the shit out of myself. So maybe I shouldn't say anything. But... Alright, well that's it for this episode of Sports House Podcast. So, until next time, peace.